Ponce, welcome back to Métis Minute, your source for Métis news in Region 7. Welcome back to Métis Minute. I am your host, Samantha Loney, and I am in beautiful Almont, Ontario, to bring you footage of the Reconciliation Through Art event put together by the OG President of the Métis Nation of Ontario, Tony Belcour. We are excited to have been invited to this event on National Truth and Reconciliation Day. As we all know, you can't have reconciliation without truth. So while we were there at the event, we were able to not only experience the artists and their nod to the survivors of the residential school system here in Canada, but we were also able to experience Indigenous culture. We know that National Day for Truth and Reconciliation can be upsetting to a lot of us Indigenous folks, but we wanted to bring you a celebration of Indigenous culture today. We have Inuit throat singing, Métis fiddling, and much more for you to enjoy. Good morning and welcome on this beautiful sunny day to the city of Almont in Ontario. Beautiful little town, really stunning. And we're here today uh, in part of the commemoration of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation to put on a very, very special multimedia event it's got a lot of moving parts. Oh my gosh, I tell you, if you just kind of walk around here and, and, and if you're out there in internet land, uh, you're going to have people doing that for you here, walking around and showing you all the cool stuff that we've got. We've got all kinds of art. It's gonna be a multimedia show, so we've got all kinds of stuff, like for instance, uh, from stone carving, or from carving of wood, and uh, we've got uh, music. We're going to have Inuit, Métis, First Nations, we're going to have crafts, beadwork, visual art. The list goes on. We, we're even going to have some uh, uh, educational stuff going on upstairs uh, in the uh, other rooms, uh, some traditional storytelling, a lot of cool stuff going on. And uh, the young lady playing piano for, for the back of the music that we're hearing and just happens to be my daughter, Aurora. So, But now, at this point, we're going to throw it over to, well, I would say he's probably one of the if not the prime motivating force behind getting all these folks together, uh, the Right Honorable Dr. Tony Belcourt. Thanks a lot, David. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, before we uh, uh, go along any further, we'd like to uh, uh, open the day in a, in a good way. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, water walk this morning and an offering uh, to the river. Uh, we were uh, graciously hosted in that water walk by uh, Carol and Miracle, uh, Bear Clan, Haudenosaunee, traditional woman from Clan Enega. And uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Doris Lanigan, who's a um, Métis Elder and Senator uh, for the Métis Nation of Ontario for Southwestern Ontario. Uh, she lives in Southwestern Ontario. She's from Saskatchewan. Um, Doris will uh, uh, now give us the opening prayer. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome the Chief of the First Nations, Dan Kahoko and uh, the First Nations artists, the Métis artists, the Inuit throat uh, singers and the uh, music performers, the storytellers, the teachers, the singers, the dancers and the drummers and all of our guests. Um, as our Thanksgiving is fast approaching, I will make my prayer today a prayer of thanks for all that is good in this land and in our lives and the wonderful event here today. We are grateful for the progress we, the government, and the Truth and Rec Reconciliation Commission, who are trying to address all the outstanding calls to action, they've only addressed three. 
I just found out. <laughs> but anyway, um, who are trying to address all outstanding calls to action as quickly as the governments do, and for all the survivors, the relatives of lost children, and the parents and families and friends of the murdered and missing women and girls and boys, in order to ease their anguish and find some semblance of peace, we offer our prayers for them today. O oh, great spirit, creator of all things, we are truly grateful for all of our blessings for our gifts that surround us and the opportunity for the First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit, and all the artists who share their creations with us. Thank you for the lovely warm summer we have had and the health, happiness, and joy we so easily take for granted in our peaceful country at times. We thank you for inspiring Mr. Tony Belcour and his team for hosting this wonderful event to raise money for the artists in this wonderful part of Ontario. We, on this day of truth and reconciliation, we thank you for the honor of sharing our prayers, thoughts, and condolences as we remember our lost children, the survivors who suffer still, and the grandfathers and grandmothers, the mothers and fathers, and ourselves who have suffered abuse, humiliation, and injury, and the loss of our loved ones. Creator, we thank you for the generosity of the people here in El Monte for the accommodations, the food, the hospitality, the friendliness of all those who made our art fundraiser a wonderful success, and for the artists and our Kushkapeo leadership, Tony Belcour, George Samard, Jason Berg, and all who strive to make the art world so much better. O oh, Creator, give us one heart and one mind as we walk on this journey, together in love, strength, in truth, reconciliation, tolerance, and peace. We offer our prayers for all of our people, and we pray for a kinder future. Miigwech. Thank you very much, Doris. Uh, I'd like everybody to know that uh, we have a uh, if anybody needs emotional support at any time during the day, we have a quiet area and a, an emotional support uh, a person up on the second floor. You want the stairs and uh, you'll, you'll find them, that person up there in that area. Um, Doris is going to uh, tell her story uh, later on today uh, and uh, it's quite, uh, quite compelling about uh, the experience of her family in Saskatchewan with the new residential school in the 60s scoop. Um, it's, uh, this is a, a great town. Uh, the people here in this town are incredibly supportive of Indigenous people. And we have a wonderful group here it's called Mississippi Mills All My Relations. Uh, they've been uh, behind us all the way and very much uh, integral to what we do uh, in terms of reconciliation. I now uh, invite the uh, chairperson of that group to give us a land acknowledgement, uh, Sue, Sue Evans. Good morning, everyone. This is a land acknowledgement that we use at our meetings. I think it's important that every group think about where they are and what it means to them when they write their land acknowledgement. We are located on the traditional unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and the Anishinaabe. This people has inhabited and cared for these lands for thousands of years and continues to care for them today. We acknowledge that these lands were once alive with Algonquin Anishinaabe language, ceremony, storytelling, teachings, and song, and that for the past several hundred years, we as a society have been oblivious of the harm and trauma that our people have brought to both the indigenous people and to this land in attempting to assimilate them by creating residential schools, outlawing their practices, and carelessly exploiting the land for our own objectives. 
Today we recognize the damage our ways have caused to Mother Earth. We confess, then, that we have destroyed the original trust and friendship that once existed between us. And so we take this opportunity to show our gratitude to the Algonquin people and to this land itself for all that it provides us, beauty and balance, trails for solitude and exploring, trees for shade and birds, gardens for food and flowers, parks for gathering and playing, the river for, for tranquility and reflection. We accept a responsibility to honor this land as it has been cared for in the past. To do this, then, we seek to grow in our understanding of the truth of our history and to renew friendships with the Algonquins and other First Nations with the Métis and Inuit people, too, who live in our community. And we invite you to share in this journey with us. Miigwech. OK, everybody, you're quite welcome to a show of appreciation. <laughs> Doris for that beautiful opening yeah. prayer and thank you very much Sue uh, for reading the land acknowledgement. Um, my name is Tony Belcourt. My spirit name is uh, the bear that leads. It was a name uh, that was given to me by uh, former Ontario Regional Chief Charles Fox. Uh, I'm from uh, the historic Métis community of lac saint -Anne, and I've been in Ontario since 1972, so I'm almost feeling like this is my homeland, but, well, it's part of my homeland, the Métis Nation. It extends uh, not quite to uh, Ottawa, but certainly into Ontario. Uh, I consider myself privileged to, to be living in this territory, of the Anishinaabe people, the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people, and uh, to be amongst my own people uh, from other regions in Ontario uh, that you're going to be learning about uh, later on during the presentations. Uh, I want to uh, uh, thank all of the exhibitors who have come here. Uh, they've, uh, uh, some have come as far away as from Atacokan on the the Minnesota uh, border near um, Manitoba, uh, northwest of, uh, of Thunder Bay. Um, we, uh, we have uh, a great list of uh, uh, presenters who are going to be doing some uh, 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 storytelling and teachings. And we got some wonderful performers. First of all, you heard just a little bit, just a touch of, uh, of the great talent uh, that we have. Uh, Aurora uh, is going to be uh, uh, singing later today. An absolutely incredible voice, just blowing you away. Anyway, we may even get her to do a little bit of that later. Uh, sometime during the day. Uh, she, she'd jump at any chance she can. <laughs> get up here in front of that piano and sing. Um, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge and thank the organizing committee. I, I couldn't do this uh, on my own, obviously. Uh, and I especially want to give thanks to our co-chair, uh, Pamela Steele. I don't know where she is. There she is. I'm going to ask Pamela to come up uh, in just a minute to give a proper uh, uh, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, I now is Dan Kohoko here. I guess he hasn't arrived yet. The uh, representative of the uh, uh, Pickwakanagan First Nation uh, is coming from there, so I guess he must have had problems all along the way, but we'll get Dan up here as soon as he arrives. Um, as I mentioned, this is a great town. Uh, welcoming Indigenous people. This whole event actually uh, came about because uh, the mayor of Mississippi Mills, uh, Crystal Laura, 
Lori uh, called me in the spring and uh, and we had, she wanted to have coffee. We went and had coffee in a great little coffee shop here called Ottawa Valley Coffee. And uh, she said, are you planning anything this year? Because I've, I've done busters events and other things here in town. And I said, well, no, I haven't actually thought of anything. And she said, well, the town doesn't have anything planned, but if you're going to do anything, I want you to know that we'd, we'd like to support you. And then I thought, well, okay, yeah, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, and then uh, George Simard from the new Métis Artist Collective, Kushupeo, was in touch with me and telling me about the, art, the Métis Artists crawls that they're doing throughout the province. And I thought, hey, maybe we can do, a, do one here. And so then one artist after another, and I thought, why don't we have performers? Why don't we have storytellers? And here we are. Um, Pam and I uh, came over to visit the uh, executive director of this great uh, museum and uh, said, uh, I don't know, is there any chance that you, you might have an opening on September 30th? And he said, well, uh, actually you can have from September 29th to October 2nd. <laughs> wow, okay, now we know we've got space. Let's, let's fill it, and we went ahead to go and do that. Um, I want to uh, give a big thanks uh, to the support that's given to us by this town and introduce our wonderful mayor, Carrie. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Krista Lowry. Well, good morning. Well, I'm deeply honored to have been invited here to take part in this event this morning by community member and Métis leader, Kelly <coughs> Belcourt, for what's going to be, no doubt, a very meaningful celebration of Indigenous artists on such a very significant day. In 2019, the municipality of Mississippi Mills began taking steps towards learning truth so that there can be reconciliation by collaborating with Indigenous peoples and those who seek to rebuild lost relationships in crafting our land acknowledgement statement. Since that first step, we've remained committed to building and strengthening relationships. We're making ongoing efforts to understand municipal responsibilities in the journey of reconciliation and continue to provide learning opportunities for staff and council. This involves a focus on addressing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action, including call number 80, recognizing September 30th, today, as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and call 17, waiving the administration fee for commissioning documents for residential school survivors and their families to reclaim their names. This past March, staff and council also participated in the Cairo's blanket exercise it was an emotional and very raw experience, which provided people with new insights and a deeper understanding. The exercise is a step towards Truth and Reconcil Reconciliation call to action number 57 to provide education to public servants on the history of Aboriginal peoples. We remain dedicated on this path of reconciliation, recognizing that while indeed steps have been taken, there continues to be a long journey ahead towards learning and understanding. With both pride and humility, the municipality supports and encourages the growing number of reconciliation efforts occurring throughout our community of Mississippi Mills. We have a valuable partnership with our local Truth and Reconciliation Group, Mississippi Mills Online Relations. The municipality was pleased to provide Riverfront Park as the home for the Seven Gifts installation an incredible collaboration between Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists, led by All My Relations, resulting in a sacred place for both reflection and education. <laughs> the Seven Gifts is so valuable for our community, and we can't thank them enough for this gift. 
We're grateful for their ongoing efforts and initiatives like the Canadian Library, a national memorial to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. All My Relations led the local microlibrary created through this project, which was installed here at this museum in June. The municipality was also pleased to partner with them on the summer solstice celebration in June with Indigenous dance, music, food, and more. These types of events provide meaningful opportunities to learn and to connect. Honoring the culture of Indigenous people not only broadens our human story, but also ensures we remember a complete history of our community and of our country. Renewing and rebuilding these relationships begins with a full understanding of our shared past. Reconciliation requires facing the truth of the residential school system and its resulting trauma on Indigenous peoples and their communities. It begins with education, which is in part why we're here today. This event and the opportunity to learn directly from Indigenous artists, musicians, educators, and storytellers will be as powerful as we allow ourselves. Tony, to you and the incredible group you've brought together today, thank you for sharing your gifts, your talents, and your stories. And to all those who are attending, I encourage you to participate with open hearts and open minds in all that is offered about Indigenous culture, art, and history today. What's said and what is not said, while we'll continue on this journey of rebuilding relationships, today on National Day for Truth and Reconciliation and Every Day. Thank you, uh, Mayor Lowry. Um, we can't uh, put on events like this unless we have a lot of support from sponsors. Uh, we have uh, two major sponsors that uh, we want to acknowledge at this time. Uh, they have uh, provided an incredible amount of support for us. Uh, I'd like to call the representative uh, uh, for the Métis Nation of Ontario, Andy Dufresne, who is the regional councillor for this part of uh, uh, the Métis Nation's activities in southern Ontario. Andy. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, before I, I begin, I would like to reflect on, on history and the words of uh, Louis Riel. He had said in the late 1800s, my people will sleep for 100 years, but when they awake, it will be the artists who give them their spirit back. And I truly believe that, seeing what we have today. So let's It's an honor to be here, and I, I'm surrounded by so many faces and good friends and good spirits. So I, I wish to the state to be forever embodied in, in, in my thoughts and share it with my friends and my family. Good morning to all, to you on this uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day. The Indian residential schools operated in Canada between 1870s and the 1990s. The last Indian residential school was closed in 1997. Children between the ages of 4 and 16 attended these residential schools. Now, reconciliation is about developing an understanding for and honoring the facts of our history. The voices of our First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities were silenced back then. This led our governments and church one institutes creating the residential school system across Canada. <coughs> Many communities, Métis families, Métis children, were affected by these policies. Today, we stand to honor Indian residential and day school survivors. We mourn the children who did not return and recognize the harm that was placed on these children. We must acknowledge and encourage respect for all residential school survivors who continue to experience lasting impacts of residential schools. Thank you for being part of this important day. Your commitment to truth and standing with us 
on the path towards healing and reconciliation. On behalf of the Métis Nation, I thank you. Thanks, I just wanted to say uh, a couple words about the Métis Nation of Ontario. There's uh, uh, some uh, misunderstanding about uh, uh, our historic communities in this, in this province. Uh, the historic Métis communities are, of Ontario are uh, generally around the uh, Upper Great Lakes and, uh, and out west from there. We're going to hear uh, uh, a lot about, or not a lot, you're going to hear the, the stories about the Métis communities of the Upper Great Lakes and in particular Sault Ste. Marie, uh, which is the home of uh, the one uh, a case that Métis took to the Supreme Court of Canada. It's called the Pauli case. We have, uh, as do First Nations, we have a lot of people who live in cities and towns that are outside of their territory. Uh, we are guests in these territories. We don't have any historic communities in the Haudenosaunee territory, and we don't have any here uh, in, this, in this territory. So I just wanted to, uh, to point that out for everyone. Um, I invite you, if you're interested, uh, and I hope you will be, uh, to learn more about the Métis Nation of Ontario by going to their website, MétisNation.org. Uh, our other major sponsor who came, uh, came forward to offer a great deal of support is the Indigenous Reconciliation Fund. And I'd like to now invite Kimberly Walsh to come forward and say a few words on behalf of that uh, incredible organization. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. As Tony said, my name is Kim Walsh. I work for the Archdiocese of Ottawa, Cornwall. I actually live in Cornwall, just next to Aquasosne, so I'm heading back there this afternoon. Um, the Three years ago, almost to the day, the Canadian bishops created what they call the Indigenous Reconciliation Fund and all the different Catholic dioceses across Canada have been contributing to it. Uh, here in Ottawa, Cornwall, our contribution, when we're finished, will be $1.2 million. I was the person tasked with overseeing the fundraising, and anybody who's ever done fundraising knows it's, it's very difficult at times, and um, most people run from it. It's, it's been an interesting and educational experience for me for the last two and a half years, but I'm also, at the other end, involved with the Diocesan Reconciliation Committee, and what we do is we recommend projects to the Indigenous Reconciliation Fund, which is the national fund. And uh, this is the most recent application that came across our desk in late July, and it was pretty tight, but we, we got it in there, and we were all so excited, one, to be able to partner with the Métis organization, and also just to fund what... You know, initially I only saw the, the website and it looked like such a great event. And I'm so pleased that I'm here this morning and it's like the website comes to life, only better. And um, one of the, the best parts of all the, you know, the, the hard work of the fundraising part is being able to come and see the fruition and see these amazing events. And I've been, to, I've been lucky enough to go to a few of them. This is the most recent one. As I said, I'm going to one this afternoon in Aquasosne, and it just, it really is, it makes all the other work worthwhile. Certainly, all we did was give money. I have to acknowledge all the work of Tony and Pamela, and their, I'm sure, huge organizing committee, all the artists who come, all your beautiful work. Have a great day. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I see him in the back. He's always so shy. And come on up here, Michael. Uh, as he walks up, I uh, want you to. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you Michael Ridley Lancaster, who's the executive director of this beautiful museum. Uh, and he's this, uh, all possible for us here and upstairs. And there's an incredible display of, uh, of the, uh, well, the history and, and all of the machinery that was used in the millworks uh, here. 
uh, in past history. This was this was the largest uh, woolen mill town in, in North America at one time, and it's all of that history and knowledge is preserved upstairs and in this man's head, <laughs> Michael. Thank you. I'm humbled to be up here and, and, and to have invited and welcomed everyone into the space and thank you, Elder Tony. My name is Michael Reichley Lancaster. My pronouns are he, him. I am a white cis male, which gives me privilege. Outside of that, I am a member of the queer community. Our museum is, a, is, is challenging the way we work. We just finished a process of starting a new strategic plan and we engaged an indigenous person to lead us through that strat plan. So now we have a new five year way forward that is, and, and her business is called Inclusive Voices. So in that planning, we engaged with the full community, engaged with indigenous, black, people of color, 2SLGI plus community members to build and lead in creating that five year plan. We are on the start of that journey. One thing we also stood up for during lockdowns was we stood up against hate in our community. We then became the first rainbow registered museum in Canada for standing up against that hate. And we're not gonna stop. We are working with our community members for them to tell their stories and stop us as our wrongdoings of past in us telling stories for people. And the first of those is we just got federal grant funds to do an oral history project to do oral histories of the 2S LGBTQIA community members in this county to talk about their identity and clothing. We'll be continuing to do more and more work over time with Elder Tony and others in the community to help tell their stories and their truths. Um, we're so proud of the work we've done to date, but we're so much more proud of what we're going to do to make more change for the community, but also for everyone to tell their stories. Because to me, when you say it's a community museum, it has to be the full community. Thank you. I'd now like to uh, call up our incredible co-chair. I mean, you have no idea how well organized this one is. She just uh, blows me away. Um, I, always there. Every time I turned around, uh, this is a turned out to be quite complex. Uh, like, heck of a lot more than I thought of it was going to be when I sat down with uh, Mayor Lord. But uh, with the uh, with the, the, the incredible organizational talents and help of uh, of our co-chair Pamela Steele, uh, I've never been able to pull it off. So Pamela, why not but say something? Hello. I would like to thank all of our volunteers. We are a volunteer uh, committee, and so there's the committee that meets all the time on Zoom. Zoom is awful. <laughs> but the committee is awesome, and everybody does different roles in there. I'm just going to highlight a few people. So um, uh, we have David Finkel, who's our sound engineer here. He's also on the committee. We have Ann Noonan, and she's from Pickwaknagan. Um, she's our liaison with Pickwaknagan. Um, we have Sheila Grantham, she's from Algonquin College and has been doing communications with us. We have Lynn Melbourne, she's a vendor, an uh, artist vendor over there. No, not she's not a vendor at all, pardon me. She is not a vendor, she is an artist only. Um, and she's our Elmont liaison. And we have we have George Samard, and he's our liaison with Kushkapeyu, um, the Métis Artist Collective representative. 
and we have the Elmont Workhorses. We have Margie Graff, she is the one who's coordinating the school presentations with our presenters who are presenting upstairs soon. She's been amazing and has done so much, so much. She's even coordinated a visit to um, Fairview Manor with Kevin, one of our, our performers, a little later this afternoon. She's crazy, crazy organized. And we have Elena Sultana, and she is our social media person. She's young. <laughs> she knows what she's doing. <laughs> we also have David Jolief. He's new to town. He was in publishing, and we made him work with us <coughs> doing promotions. He's amazing, too. He's, he's made sure that we are covered from Kingston all the way up to Pembroke and Smith Falls all the way this way and then through CBC everywhere and then he's just, he's, he works hard and he's retired. <laughs> um, then we have Latish, Latisse, Latisse, I think, I'm better at that. Uh, she is our liaison with the artists and the performers and Sometimes the vendors, she is the one who coordinates everything behind the scenes and sends emails to everybody. She's great. And we have Terry Clark, who has organized all of the billeting. So all the artists who are coming from a long ways away, Terry has communicated with them to set up hosts from Elmont, um, wonderful Elmont residents who are putting them up for the night last night, maybe tonight too. Awesome. And I have Catherine uh, Pellerin, who's back at the um, raffle table, and she has taken on the entire raffle schmozzle back there. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work, too. <laughs> and um, we also have a, a, a Dennis Morrow, who is taking pictures for us for a little book that we're putting together at the end. So lots of volunteers. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. We couldn't do it without our sponsors. We have no money to pay anybody. So, um, Tommy has spoke about uh, Made Nation of Ontario and um, the Indigenous Reconciliation Fund. But we have other sponsors from Elmont. We have, um, to do, well, first of all, we have the Textile Museum and the United Church in Elmont, both of whom have lent us their spaces to do our screening yesterday and for the performance today. Yeah. And then I have a list of sponsors I want to just mention because, like again, they, they're our money source. Thank you, men, very much. We have the Elmont Civitans, the Mississippi Mills Municipality, Mississippi Mills All My Relations, The Hub and Rebound, The Made Nation .org, um, Mill Street Books, Joanne Beaton, she's a local realtor, Ottawa Region Métis Council, The Sterling here in town, Hummingbird chocolate. Did you guys see in the raffle the big chocolate peanut butter cup? <laughs> it's huge. Uh, Equator Coffee, they're the ones providing all the free coffee. Independent um, your independent grocer Johnson's is providing the tea and some other supplies. The Hum has given us free advertising through their articles and the Millstone and advertising as well. So thank you you to the whole community, we really appreciate your help. Thanks very much, Pamela. Um, I'm going to throw it over to our great announcers. Uh, uh, I'll throw it over to David, who's going to introduce uh, the next act, as it were. Uh, this will be the first act. The last one is standing right over here. Amanda Rayon, she's on her name tonight. I'm sorry, she's on her name tonight. I'm going to see you in a couple of It's my son Shane. Back there is uh, soon going to be uh, in front of the mics as well. So now, uh, without any further ado, I'll ask Dave to come up and take over. And thank you all very much for all of these wonderful people.
wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for those good words. And once again, yes, to all the volunteers. A lot of moving parts. Uh, so how many people out there have uh, ever seen... Raise your hand if you've seen Inuit throw singing. Okay, there's just a few hands going up. Uh, it's a, a very unique thing found here. Uh, you won't really find that anywhere else in the world. So uh, anyways, you guys are in for a treat. So uh, I'm just kind of here helping out with sound duties. So uh, right now what I'll do is I'll introduce Crystal Martin. All right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Put your hands together. Here. I see the coffee's starting to work now. So we're all waking up a little bit. Here. <laughs> so yes, Crystal Martin is an Inuk original from Senra Hachak. Oh, I probably slaughtered that, didn't I? You're going to have to correct me on that, provide correction. Um, and she's a creative professional with expertise in Inuit-specific project management. All right? So, you know, there's your go-to person there. Uh, she brings a unique and artistic perspective shaped by her extensive experience across Inuit Nunatgat. All right? So she's a storyteller, a filmmaker, and a soulful throat singer. <laughs> So Crystal extends her creative work beyond the traditional, enriching the narrative surrounding indigenous issues and culture. So Crystal is also a co-founder of an indigenous geographic. Have you heard of that, indigenous geographic? Yeah, that's cool, I love that one. Uh, it's an indigenous owned business that fosters awareness of the rich cultural heritage of indigenous peoples, including their spiritual beliefs, cultural practices, and traditional knowledge. Uh, also, issues such as land rights, treaty negotiations, reconciliation efforts, and the like. So, yeah, once again, put your hands together for Crystal. So the way that we say Sanariak, so the J is actually a Y sound, um, and it is formerly known as Hall Beach. Um, and uh, about eight to nine years ago, they actually changed uh, their uh, name back to our traditional name called Sanariak, which means on the shoreline. Um, and I've seen a lot of people have put their hands up for um, having heard of Inuit folk singing before. Have you heard it live, in person? Yes. Oh, a good portion. Well, I'm only one person, so I hate to disappoint y'all, but <laughs> it's going to sound very different. Um, but uh, yeah, so I actually learned how to throat sing. Actually, I first heard of throat singing when I was about 17, um, and I actually heard it from my sister. And um, so I was uh, born in Iqaluit, um, Northwest Territories at the time. Um, and uh, like all Baffin babies that are born, you're born in Iqaluit because that's the only place that has a hospital. Um, and I was raised in Senaliak, which is my hometown. And by the age of 10, we actually moved down to Ontario, uh, Renfrew to be exact. We were there for about a year and then we moved to Eganville. Um, and I haven't left since. Um, and um, my sister, however, she is uh, living in Nunavut, and she was actually traditionally adopted to my grandparents. Uh, customary adoption is really big um, in our community, um, and when you are customarily adopted, you know who your biological family are, you know who your parents are, your siblings, and you have a relationship with them. And uh, so growing up, I only ever knew her as my sister, not as my aunt. And um, she stayed behind in Senaliak with my grandfather because that's who her father was. And it took me some time, but we had conversations after conversations and hours and hours and hours of, of talking about um, you know, me moving back when I'm 18 to you know, come live back home again. Um, but I ended up getting pregnant with my son, so I stayed put in Eganville. And um, during that time, my sister had heard about throat singing. And she says to me, Have you heard of before? Which is throat singing. And I'm like, what's that? 
She's like, you're going to have to watch some YouTube videos. <laughs> and so, of course, I started looking at YouTube videos, and um, I seen some traditional throat singing, but I had no idea that it was two people with making um, the same rhythmic noises, um, but only half a second apart. So when I started learning, I was trying to do it all myself, and I got so lightheaded, and I'm like, I don't understand how this works. So my sister taught me by phone, and uh, we didn't have Skype or Zoom or any of that back then, and it was all by telephone, and it was actually landline, believe it or not, I'm not trying to age myself or anything, but it was by landline, and she was teaching me some songs, and she said, the first song you want to learn is Hamma, and I'm like, Hamma, she's like, yeah, like, Hamma. And then, so I kept trying it, and it was like, I don't even know how to pretend not to do hummus anymore, uh, but that is the first song that any throat singer is taught, is <laughs> And so I'm gonna get all of you to try going humma. Let's hear it. <laughs> That's awesome. So. Throat singing is um, very guttural, as you know, um, but it's also uh, all of the air that's coming from your stomach. And we have these two um, muscles that we actually don't use every single day. And um, I, I don't really know the explanation behind it um, or how that even works, but it works that way. And traditionally, as many of you have heard, um, throat singing came from a, a form of imitation of the environment. Um, and um, there's different imitations like the wind. There's the, um, the goose, actually. This morning we were walking in here and we heard a goose. And my bunny, my daughter, Callie, who is sitting behind me over here, she's very shy. Um, she's like, Mommy, can you make that noise? And I'm like, well, I think so. And uh, so I practiced a little bit on the way here and then we were also practicing our turkey calls as well. Um, but there's very um, various imitations, and so the geese actually in itself has different variations. There's like three or four different variations of the geese, depending on the region from um, you've learned it from. Um, and within Inuit Nunanga, which is Inuit homelands, there are four uh, different regions. So there's Nunavut, of course everybody knows Nunavut. Um, there's Nunavik, which is in northern Quebec. Uh, there's Nunat Seabut in uh, Northern Labrador, and there's Inu Valley, which is in Northwest Territories. And depending on the regions where you're from, it could sound very different. So there's different melodies, there's different sounds, there's different rhythms. Um, and um, when I first started learning, I was really intrigued, and then I heard um, Tanya um, Dagak. Um, who's very well known uh, for her modern contemporary punk throat singing. And I'm a huge fan of her. Um, she really has been able to uh, help amplify um, contemporary modern Inuit throat singing. Um, and then there's the traditional throat singers um, that are all across Inuit Nunana as well, that are um, even you know in the Ottawa area that are traveling all over the world showcasing Inuit traditional practices. And uh, so over the years when I started learning, I know I'm like giving you guys a whole slew of, you know, but I think it's really important for people to understand why it's so important for us to reclaim, revitalize, and preserve our traditional practices, especially since today is about truth and reconciliation. And today is all about uh, ensuring that um, Indigenous peoples uh, all over Turtle Island have the opportunity to really uh, immerse themselves in their traditions and in their cultures. And so uh, when I was in high school, I went to uh, Obiango High School, shout out to them. Um, and uh, my guidance counselor at the time, she is Algonquin. She, she is Algonquin. She was um, probably uh, the best um, student counselor that I've ever been around. She's a really good friend of mine, Judy Ellis, and, um, and also um, Tina Nelson. Uh, who was my Native Studies teacher, and they really got me to become curious about my cultural identity and really tried to help me find where my path could lead. And uh, so I was telling them about throat singing, I'm like, yeah, I spent like hours and hours on the phone with my sister trying to understand throat singing, trying to throat sing. And so this one time I was like, embarrassed about it now, but I was like so proud because on National Aboriginal People's Day on June 21st at school, 
um, they had invited me to come up in uh, the gymnasium uh, to throat sing. And I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea. I probably sounded terrible. But all of those practices really helped me become confident in being able to throat sing and being able to take pride in that revitalization. And uh, so um, after you know a few years, I met Charlotte Kamenek, who is part of Sila and Rise, or she was part of Sila and Rise at the time. She's now with Sila, her uh, friends, uh, Cynthia and Sila. And uh, they travel all over the world as well. And Charlotte and I were colleagues at Tunga Sabinga Inui, which is TI in um, Ottawa. And uh, she's the one that taught me all of the different songs. And um, you know, I can't thank her enough for really telling me the stories behind that and giving me so much time and patience as I learned to navigate all of the different muscles that we have in our, um, uh, in our body to be able to mimic these sounds. Um, and so, one of the things too with throat singing is you don't want to drink too much water, but I'm a little dry. Um, you're actually supposed to drink something warm like tea because it really helps with the, um, uh, the muscles and relaxing the muscles. And uh, I really want to, there's this one song, I, I mentioned that everything has, um, everything mimics the environment, there, but there's this one particular song that I can't emphasize the importance and significance of, and it's called Qinnaruwapik. Qinnaruwapik is a poor little puppy. And this song actually has uh, words in it, and the words are, the poor little puppy always gets the leftovers, but it's still good. So when I hear that, and when I'm singing that, it really puts me in a, a place of appreci appreciation for um, you know, this little girl who had a, a dog team, and there was this one little runt in the dog team who was literally getting all of the leftovers. But she kept practicing and working with him, and sure enough, this poor little puppy became the leader of the dog team. And for me, that really comes down to um, preservation, promotion, and protection of Inuit throat singing. So I'll give you an example. It doesn't sound the same when there's only one person. Uh, I was like looking around and I'm like, do I know anybody here that are Inuit you know, that can throat sing? Um, but uh, I haven't been able to find anybody. Oh, oh, thank you for the tea. <laughs> um, and. Um, so anyways, this, this song is, is very meaningful and actually uh, my business partner, Matt, I don't know where he went, um, but we recently um, did um, a throat song mixed with Métis music. Um, and uh, for us, it, um, it really is about that connection that we need, need to have and um, we really want to be able to emphasize that connection that we have because Inuit are also really big into square dancing. Uh, we have fiddle, we have accordion, um, so we're very well connected when it comes to that music as well. So we want to be able to blend those two. Being Inuk you know, myself and my business partner being Métis, we really wanted to showcase our identity within our business and, and also for people to be able to relate to that. And the song was And um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's not available right now, but I'm giving you guys a little teaser. Um, so Kinawarawapi goes um, very much, hopefully, like this. <laughs> Song. 
Um, and um, the fiddle player was Alex Kosarak, who is Métis. And he's like got to be one of the best fiddle players that I've ever heard um, in Canada. And um, so he is um, uh, telling me the rhythm, right? So he's tapping his foot. And uh, I had to go with the tapping of his foot for the speed of the throat song. And it was like the hardest and the fastest time that I've ever done it. But I have to say right now it was probably the fastest. <laughs> um, but with throat singing, it's between two women, typically. But you will see a lot more uh, male Inuit that are throat singing now. Um, but it, it's between two people. Um, there's a leader and a follower. And uh, the follower... Or sorry, the leader is the one that sets the, the song, the tone, and the pace. But any given time, the follower can actually change the song or the rhythm or the pace. And so it's a friendly competition between two people. And it was a way of passing time. Well, Inuit um, men were gone out hunting and providing for their family. The women were left at the camp to tend to the igloo, the up with the, the children. Um, and so... Uh, because of that, they started imitating the environment. Um, there's one called Gubalu, uh, which is the river, and it seems very fitting because we're here at the Mississippi. Uh, it makes sense to, to give you an example of that, but again, it sounds very different when there's two people. Um, it's much better when you hear it from, from two. Uh, you can really hear when you're listening to it the, the vision of you know water hitting rocks and so on and so forth. I'm no expert uh, by any means, uh, but throat singing is such a beautiful um, tradition that we have in Inuit culture and the Inuit community. And um, I'm thankful for the amount of uh, support that I've received from fellow throat singers that are uh, all across Inuit Nunanga for teaching me, uh, for guiding me, and for being my absolute, you know, biggest supporters um, anytime. Um, and, you know, I think what's really important is also, you know, highlighting to the younger generations, like Callie, who's just kind of sitting around. <laughs> Um, and saying that, you know, throat singing is a big part of who we are as Inuit. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, um, it's really fun. I enjoy it. Um, I'm just trying to, do I have, how much time do I have? Oh, okay, perfect. Oh, okay, wonderful. <laughs> um, that's it, though. I love having people come up and try a throat song with me, and well, I promise it's going to be the hamma, it'll be the easiest. Do I have any volunteers? Is that Tony that's volunteering? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, come on up. So I'll show you guys how it's uh, traditionally done as well if you haven't seen it before. Hi there, I'm Crystal. Pardon me? Roxanne, very nice to meet you, Roxanne. All right, so we're going to hold, I'm going to hold on to this, we'll hold each other's arms like so, yeah, and then we're going to go with Hama. So you keep going and I will jump in. You keep going and I'll jump in.
opening my eyes really wide to intimidate her a little bit, but she was straight faced with me, like she meant business. <laughs> I can tell you that you can feel the energy, the connection with the arms, with the face, with the voice. You literally can feel this electric current running between the two of you. And it's going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Kitty Wedge, Marcy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming up. What a gem. And so, um, yeah, like, like she had mentioned, so you typically hold each other and you're facing each other. And the reason why you're swaying back and forth is um, Inuit women have what's called an amounty, which is a baby carrier. Um, and so there's like a pouch um, that goes in your back and then there's a hood. Um, and this amounty is where the baby's sitting in the pouch. Um, and when you're throat singing, the baby actually feels the vibration. And when you're swaying back and forth, what do you do with the baby when you're holding the baby? You naturally sway back and forth. And so with the vibration and with the swinging, it actually is very soothing for the baby, and um, which is one of the reasons why uh, Inuit um, with throat sing looking at each other back and forth. Um, do I have another volunteer? Anybody want to learn how to throat sing? Everyone's like, yeah, no, not happening. Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, okay, awesome. All right, what's your name? Eric Sabarin. Eric, thank you for coming up. All right, we're going to try the humma. All right, you ready for it? All right. All right, so you go humma, you go. Well, okay, so you keep going and I'm going to jump in. Probably my broccoli boy. So you go and you you keep going and I will jump in, all right? So we're going to hold each other by the arm, is that okay? Like this? All right, okay. as well, Kevin coming up Mason, he also throat sings, and uh, him and I used to share an office in Ottawa together um, at TI, and uh, when I heard him throat sing, like, I just got, right away my ears perked up, and I got goosebumps, and I'm like, that is such a deep tone, like, who is doing that? And sure enough, it was Kevin, and uh, so you're seeing a lot more male that are now throat singing as well, and, and being able to revitalize and, and safeguard throat singing. Um, there's also another song um, that I'll do, um, and it's called The Love Song. And this song originated from Baker Lake Nunavut, and um, it's very soft, but then becomes very guttural. Again, it sounds very, very different with one person, um, but if you want to check it out, TikTok is actually really big for um, Inuit throat singers, so you'll be able to find, even if you were to go into the search bar, Inuit throat singing you'll see a slew of Indian women that are duetting each other, which is really cool. Um, and if you were to look at like the love song, uh, Indian throat singing love song, you'll be able to hear it um, and be able to make a comparison. But this is just one example of how one throat song is um, um, used, or not used, but played. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a love song. Thank you. And then there's one that's called um, the competition. The competition is like a very like it really depends. Like there's all different kinds of songs that you throw in there, and it's literally a competition between the two women. Then it gets very competitive. Um, and um, uh, there's you know the iu'a, which is our alphabet. 
which is a film production and educational company uh, with my business partner, Matt LeMay, who is taking a picture over there right now. He's walking around the camera. Um, and uh, we work with um, Indigenous communities, organizations uh, all across Canada and actually internationally um, in helping to amplify Indigenous stories through Indigenous lens. The majority of our team, um, I think it's like 90 seven, 98% of our team members are Indigenous, so we represent all Inuit, Métis, and First Nations on our team, which is very, very important to us. Um, and uh, we're spread, spread across from coast to coast to coast. Uh, we are not just um, in Ontario. We have team in Saskatchewan, in BC, Nunavut, uh, Nova Scotia. We are literally coast to coast to coast, and we're all about amplifying Indigenous uh, voices. And today on TRC Day as well, one of the films that we worked on with the Métis Nation Saskatchewan is a documentary, an 18-minute documentary called Waiting for Justice. Um, the uh, Isla Cross survivors of residential school have not seen justice, um, and um, Métis are the only ones that have been left out in the TRC, and so one of the things that we have been working on is to help amplify their stories and to ensure that uh, Métis survivors are included um, in uh, the um, uh, apology of the residential schools and are getting compensated uh, for uh, the harms that they have received and the communities have received as well. Um, so I encourage you, you can visit um, our website, you can um, take a look at Waiting for Justice. Uh, it's a very, um, it can be a very triggering uh, documentary, so just a heads up on that. Um, but I encourage you to please um, have a watch and, and share with your, your network. Queen and me, we're going to Tennessee. Have a great day.
Kitchen of Red Shaw, let him have it. Um, I'm Fox and Vision Class, I come from Ndonji and I'm from Ndonji, um, and I think that's all I remember right now. Um, but hi everybody, my name is Amanda Fox. I'm Ojibwe from Mokomakanga to the territory on Manitoulin Island, and I'm proud to be here with you today on the territory. Um, yeah, thank you to Kevin Lamar for opening us, opening, opening with that song. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the jingle dress and what I'm wearing today. Um, thank you to Tony Belfort for inviting me. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here and be able to share this with you. Um, so for those that don't know me, um, yeah, my name's Amanda Fox. I've been dancing since I could walk. I'm 35 years old now, so it's been quite a long time. I've been teaching in school since I was about four or five years old. Um, yeah, I've been, I was in schools all day today, and it was, it was a really, really good day to be able to um, share share what I know with, with, with all of you. Um, so we watch for being here, we watch for making the time. Um, so I'll, I'll start by talking about the jingle dress. So the jingle dress, um, I'll share what I know. Our stories are always told orally, and um, back in the day, you know, we would never really write anything down. And so there's a lot of different stories about the jingle dress, but I'll share the one that I was taught um, back, back where I'm from. I'm from Wiki, and this is the, the story that we know, um, or my family anyway. But the jingle dress is known as a healing dress. And the jingle dress is, um, it comes from a dream. And so there's this little girl, her name was Maggie White. She came, she came from uh, Lake of the Woods area. And that little girl, Maggie White, she was very, very sick. Her family thought that they were going to lose her. She was curled into a ball because of how sick she was. And um, her grandfather had some dreams throughout his life, actually. And so what, what he did when, when that little girl became sick, he realized what those dreams came to him for. And so he got to work right away. He got some women in the community to make a dress similar to the one that he saw in his dream. And um, what they did was, was they had a ceremony for that little girl. And they placed that little girl in this jingle dress. And throughout the days, that little girl, she started to feel better. And she started to feel even better. She was surrounded by her family, by her friends. And um, yeah, she started to feel better, and she was able um, to start dancing just after a few days of being very, very sick. And so that little girl danced until her late 80s, and she lived all of her life. And there was a, there's a longer version of that story, but I, I don't want to take all day to, to share it. But um, it was a, a story that I got to hear directly from Maggie White's, um, Maggie White's, I think, great-granddaughter or granddaughter um, just a few years ago. And that story, she actually told, we actually um, had a full gathering, a full day gathering, and she was able to share that story um, within a full day. So you can, you can see how long our stories, our stories may take. Um, but I also wanted to share the story of my dress. So um, for, for those who have never been to a powwow, I'm not sure if you've ever been to a powwow, but what I'm doing is a powwow dance. So this is one dance style. Um, around here, there's about, I would say about seven different dance styles. If you go out to Alberta, there could be anywhere from, I would say, nine to twelve different dance styles. But over here, we have the women's jingle dress, we have the women's fancy shawl, we have the women's traditional, the men's traditional, the men's grass, the men's fancy, the hoop dance. Oh, we have chicken as well. Um, but I, as I talked about, um, like if you go out to Alberta, you'll see the horse dance, you'll see um, that chicken dance, but the chicken dance you'll see, some, if you come to the house over here, you'll see like maybe two or three chicken dancers. You go over there, you'll see anywhere from 60 to 100 different dancers. Um, so yeah, it's a really, really beautiful place to be. So for those who have never been to a powwow, I encourage you guys to come out, um, come join us. We have these songs, they're called intertribal songs. And you'll hear the person with the MC. It's always important to listen to the person that has the mic because they're the ones who are explaining what's happening um, throughout, throughout the powwow. 
And so you might hear the person with the mic, the MC, they might say, okay, intertribal song, everyone come out and dance. And that's when it's your turn to come out and dance with us. So yeah, I always say feel free to come and join us at Apao and um, watch, our, watch our dances, but you can also join us in the, in the circle during those, during those songs. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll get started. We'll be doing two songs together. Um, so yeah, I'll do this first song by myself just to show you what a jingle dress looks like. And you'll get to hear the beautiful uh, singing of Papa Sage on here. So, um, like I said, these young men are just uh, under a year of learning to sing, and uh, I, I teach them, so I, uh, I learned in my community when I was about 16, so that's over like 20 years ago, and uh, I went through a youth program there, and I learned how to sing and everything there, and I stuck with it. There was about 1,300 youth in my community that also did it, but statistically out of that, only four of us actually uh, went forward and continued with that. So. I wanted to do something like that again for the community, so I proposed this to our uh, our child welfare agency, the Gigni Bikiwin. 
and uh, they set up the program where I was teaching, and then while I was doing it, we had another member return home who didn't live there, but he's a singer, so I tried to, uh, I w I've made it now where we have three different singers that come in and teach the boys, so they're going to do a, a sidestep here. I didn't teach them this one, this is one of the other teachers, but I know the song they're singing. So yeah, it's, um, it's really nice to see them grow. I've, uh, I've sat and tried to teach men down in uh, southern Ontario and none of them have the confidence to do leads and these guys are rocking leads already. So yeah, let's hear it for Papa Sage. I just changed it up. I gave them a little bit of a challenge. So I asked them to do two push ups, which is half a song of a side step. So I'm just going to show you what a side step looks like. But then I'm going to do two um, push ups of a straight. So I figured um, because I was talking about POW earlier, because I was talking about intertribal dancing, um, I wanted to give, get the opportunity to share with you um, what it would be like dancing for those who have never been to a powwow. Um, so we're going to get that chance to, to dance. Um, and I'll, I'll do some really, really basic steps. But yeah, I figured we'll, we'll do a little dance together. We'll stay in our spots. But yeah, for this, so for the first two push-ups, I'll do this um, side step. So I side step, um, how I knew it before, and what I was taught as a little girl was that the side step, um, it was never really used in powwow, it was used in ceremony. And that's, that's, it was a really, well it still is a really sacred, sacred dance. But the side step, um, it was used during ceremony. So when we would place that little girl, that little girl Maggie White, when we would place her, or place anybody who's ill, we would place them in the middle in that circle. And then what we would do all together, you'll still see it at powwows, if you come to powwows, where um, if it's usually an Ojibwe or someone who has been dancing for a long time, this is how they'll usually lead it. But what we do as jingle dress dancers, we'll all stand beside each other so we don't spread out usually during that honor song or during that uh, healing song. And so when we're dancing, we're using all of our strength, all of our, our jingle dress power <laughs> to, um, to help heal heal those that need it, but heal um, the person that requested it. But sometimes, as jingle dress dancers, we're dancing, we could be dancing for ourselves, for our families, but we're taught to dance for those who need it, who go, for those who can't dance. So that's what I was always taught. Um, so yeah, we'll get started with this side step, and then we'll go quickly into um, a dance together.
You guys did so good. I gave you a challenge and you, and you did it. Um, so yeah, Jimmy Bush for joining me today, me and Papa Sejong group. Um, Jimmy Bush for singing for me. Um, it really feels good to hear that, those voices um, singing for me. Jimmy Bush. Uh, so 
uh, uh, she she was very she left home at 16 to to de dedicate herself uh, to work as a hairdresser and uh, she also had two sisters two two younger sisters and uh, 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 so I, I the next set of teams that I'm going to be sharing with you represent that that unity of those 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 sisters within that family and, and for me they also represent those three beautiful plants. Uh, that's corn, beans, and squash that, that also equally support one another. And so this theme of support um, is really resonating in, in this, in this uh, uh, slide and, and in this moment. And in the spirit of this piece, the three sisters. And uh, these are tunes that I learned from a recording from a fiddler named Granny Fagnon um, back in the 1980s, um, uh, 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 an incredible fiddle ally, uh, Anne Letterman, who meant into these remote communities, particularly in Manitoba, with the help of Teddy Boy, and uh, recorded many of these these older fiddlers who were, um, you know, very, uh, some of them barely could still hear and, and play, and 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 before they they you know their music passed with with their their passing, and, and so it's really because of Teddy Boy and Anne that that um, we're able to still hear this music, and and uh, um, part of what I uh, am here to also do is is to play it live instead of also just hearing recordings um, because that's where music really lives. It's in these spaces, it's in these lived experiences together. So here are the three sisters. <laughs> Um, and this is a Plains Cree word that means the people who are in command 
independent oneself, the, the free people. Um, and in order to step into a place of self-command and, and, and freedom, for me at least, it's it's about that acquiring that self-knowledge. Um, if, if, when when we're when we're stepping to that into that space of, of, of self knowledge, there's there's more liberation because it, it allows us to to have the ability to have be a choice. Um, and, and for me, having uh, uh, expanding that ability to, to be a choice always in, in situations and having that power to be a choice it is that place of, of self command of, of, of freedom and, and liberation that I think uh, many of us uh, are seeking. At least uh, I speak on behalf of myself um, as a seeker of, of, of liberation um, and, and love. And uh, so that, that infinity symbol is, is really um, cultivating that, that relationship within ourselves and how do we relate to one another in this, in this space and seeing one another actually as human beings um, and, 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 and knowing that we all really come from the same place. Um, and, and, and how can we return back to that, that space of equality? Um, these are all questions um, rather than always having the answer. And uh, um, what else can I say? Um, and, and we also have, so us as Métis people, we, we have our own uh, distinct culture that is a mix of those, of those two um, nations coming together as, 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 as uh, coming together as the, the original peoples of these land along with the arrival of the, of the fur traders. Um, and, and so our, our music um, is, is a blend of those two things. Our, our language is, the, is a blend of those two things. Our food, everything, our, our clothing, it's, it's that really of that, that honoring of that, that relationship that was formed uh, over several centuries of contact um, that, 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 that really um, uh, created this new culture. Of, and, and sometimes we like to use the word ethnogenesis. Um, ethno meaning uh, um, a group of people, and, and genesis meaning birth. So that's, there's that birth um, of, of us as a as a nation through that process of, of many several centuries of contact um, between the two groups. So it's not just like you know people are uh, uh, automatically Métis just because um, they they have children to one, uh, amongst each each other. It's really um, there's that distinctiveness of, of that relationship that happened over over many. Uh, many years, and uh, so I I'm going to speak a little bit more about uh, the music next, um, and uh, and how um, my, myself and my brothers um, really uh, came to be uh, as 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 musicians. So I was I was gifted a violin uh, when I was three, and. Uh, um, little did my parents know that um, I would become the musician that I am, but it was always kind of that, that space where I felt most comfortable and most accepted and most at ease was, was in these musical spaces. It wasn't at school, it was, it was when I was playing music and, and playing music with others. And uh, uh, being the eldest of four, I kind of paved the way for the other three to, to also uh, work together and. Um, we, we formed the Métis Fiddler Quartet. I think that Danton, the youngest, he's about 10, ten years younger than me, uh, plays the cello, which is, is not a common instrument, I would say, in, in Métis culture. However, however we're kind of, we, br we were bridging the two uh, 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 genres of, of, of the classical quartets and, and, and <coughs> music together um, in that formation. Um, sometimes I, I, I will also play viola in this, in this photo, actually, I'm playing viola rather than fiddle. And, uh, um, I think Donto was, was performing on stage for uh, MNO events as basically as soon as he could kind of like make a sound on the cello. Uh, so we kind of grew up on stage uh, together and it's, it was uh, through that mentorship uh, between Anne and, and Teddy Boy and, and also uh, we spent some time with John Arcand and, and James Chichu along the years that, that really um, helped us uh, create our own voice, voices as, as artists. And uh, so um, nowadays we're we're often in different places, so we so we don't often get to play together. However, uh, recently uh, we um, were brought back together to work with uh, the Sultans of String on their Walking Through the Fire project, um, which is um, um, bringing together indigenous and non-indigenous uh, musicians to create something new together. And, uh, it's a very uh, special uh, moment and occasion for us to, to, to play. And uh, 
um, even though it's not kind of it's it's going to be kind of out of sync in in, in terms of um, uh, uh, kind of material. I think I'm going to present to you uh, um, some acapella versions of, of what we did um, with with the Sultan. So I'm going to uh, sing for you a song that was attributed to the late Louis Riel, um, and uh, in in this song. Uh, Riel is, is awaiting uh, his execution from jail, and, and for those of you who maybe um, have a little background uh, history, um, Riel was, was somebody who was a visionary um, for, for Métis and, and indigenous rights in this country, and, and really stood up uh, at a moment in time where it was really called for, and, and with so much grace, um, and, 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 and really, you know, with, without fail, um, just standing up for what he believed in, and, and Giving up his life for for um, for that as well, and um, you know he wasn't well liked by by the orange men of these of these lands, and um, you know he was not going to give up his fight um, for what he believed in, and and so um, for me he's he, he's an inspiration uh, not only in in the way that he carried his life, however, uh, also. Um, he, he left us with a beautiful quote that, that says, my people will sleep for 100 years and it's the artists that will carry their, their voice forward. So I really feel supported by the ancestors in, in the work uh, that my brothers and I and all of us are doing um, as BT artists. And so back to the song. So Riel is, is awaiting his execution and he write, wants to write a letter to his mother. However, he doesn't have, have anything to write to her with. So he draws his own blood with uh, with a pen knife and, and expresses uh, this this beautiful uh, 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 love for his mother and, and for me um, that uh, that also represents that uh, that relationship that we, that we all have with with whether it's our birth mother or or our earth mother that eternal love that that she's always there with us. Um, so here is a chanson chanson de Riel and then I'm gonna. Follow it up, that up with a with a fiddle tune that uh, my brothers and I wrote um, called Tacaranto Real, which is a, a song, uh, a fiddle tune that's inspired with the joys of, of reconnecting with the, the, the with nature and, and 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 connecting with that part of us that is that is uh, childlike and, and that childlike spirit that really lights us up and, and wants to create and and wants to be uh, in the magic of, of this human experience. Yeah. 
watching and we hope you were able to learn more about other indigenous cultures. If you're Métis and watching this, we know that we are just one of the three indigenous peoples that call so-called Canada home. Merci for watching and we'll see you down the river.